Welcome to, to New Year's Grid Training. Uh, as Charles said, my name is Eric Palmer. I'm going to be talking about uh, programming environments and compilation. Um, I'm a member of the Programming Environments and Models Group, and I work as a software integration engineer here at NERSC. Um, so to kind of give you uh, some context of what I'm going to talk about um, is I'm kind of taking this from after you've logged into Perlmutter, you meet this terminal and kind of like, now what do you do, right? Um, you come here to do science, you need software to run on the system to make that happen. So how do you get the software you need? You have one of these four ways. You can load it into your environment using modules. Um, you can access it through containers. You can compile it from source that maybe you download from GitHub or GitLab or some somewhere else. Um, you can use package managers like Conda or SPAC, and um, I'll include E4S with a package manager, but it's kind of a fuzzy definition. Um, so in this talk, I'm going to be focusing on modules, compiling from source, and I'll quickly mention SPAC and E4S. Um, containers and Conda that will show up in other talks later, later so I won't cover them here. So first, Modules. So modules are how we sort of load pre-installed software uh, into our environment from you know on Perlmutter. So for example, if you just logged into the terminal in Perlmutter to SSH and you typed Python dash dash version, you would get the system default, which is Python 2.7.18. And you'd say, well, wait a minute, you know, Python 2, I want something newer than that. How do I get that? Well, um, you can do this command down here where you say module load Python dash 311 to get Python version 311, and it will load it as a module into your environment, right? So this command here says module list. This says list all the modules that are currently loaded into my environment. You can see you get a several of them here by default. But when I load one like this specifically, Python 311, it shows up here. And that tells me now, if I run the same command I ran at the beginning, Python dash dash version, I will now get the one that's associated with the module I loaded, and that's Python 311.7, which you probably prefer over 2.7.18. So in a nutshell, in that example just kind of briefly describes like how all the modules work. This is how you bring uh, different versions of software uh, that you want into your environment so that you can use them. Uh, we have a lot of modules on the system. Um, this list isn't really to look at, but just to show you there's lots of them. Uh, so how do you find them? Um, we'll I'll, sorry, I jumped one slide. I'll, we'll talk about how to find them after this. But by default, these are the ones you get, right? And so modules affect all sorts of different things in your environment. Um, for example, if we're looking at this default set, the one number one here, this loads the CPU architecture so that when you're compiling your code using our compiling wrappers, which I'll introduce later, it will be optimized for our CPUs and for our system. Um, you get our default programming environment. So right now, um, that's set to the GNU compiler by these modules that indicate that. You also see we have uh, the several modules for the GPU architecture. And right now, because the, the GPU module is loaded, it's set to compile code for CUDA aware MPI. So um, modules affect different things in our system. These several of them are loaded by default. And that's why we should learn about them. <laughs> okay, so if you're looking through modules and you want to know how to find them, um, there's several commands that you'll want to know. Um, We've seen module list that shows the ones that are currently loaded in your environment. If you want to load or unload modules, you can use module load or unload. Module swap, um, you know, it's it's kind of, um, I think it used to be more important with the older module system, maybe not so much anymore, because uh, you can now just directly load the one you want. It used to be you had to unload one sometimes to get the one you want. Module show will give you the details of what the module is doing to your environment. So I'll break that down in a slide later. And if you want to find a particular module um, and you're not sure what it's called or where to look, uh, I recommend Module Spider. And 
Previously, you might have used something like module avail. Well, because LMOD is sort of has a hierarchical uh, representation or let me see, um, what's the best word? A hierarchical system of how it presents the modules to you in the environment. It won't always show you every available module with module available. So, and I'll give you an example of that. So we recommend using module spider. And this scary spider picture here is to help you remember, use module spider to find your modules. Uh, there's some cool tricks here that you can do with the module command uh, to help you do modules. I'll leave them here for people to try out later. Um, so what I have here is this, just a short kind of uh, video that shows uh, an example of why I'd want to use module spider versus module avail. And in this example, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to load this Cray netcdf module. And it's just, um, it's just um, the netcdf library that I want to use. Uh, for my software. So let's take a look and watch, and I'll try not to talk too much. <clears throat> so those are the modules I'm starting with, and I just pointing out I don't have it. And so if I try to load it directly, I get this error, and it says it doesn't exist. And you might be confused and think, OK, well, uh, maybe it's not on the system, right? But that's actually not the case. And so as we learn, if I'm looking through module avail and I look for my netcdf, I actually find these other ones, but I don't find the one I want. So now if I try my Joel Spider and I see create net CDF, I see ah pops up. But if I look through this, I find out that I actually need to write out this full net CDF with the version, and then it will give me even more complete information about the module. And it turns out if I want to load create net CDF, I have to load create HDF CDF. HDF5 first. And so that's the hierarchy I was talking about earlier. So now if I load Cray HDF5, I can load Cray NetCDF and voila. So success. So that's why we recommend module spider, because it will find it modules no matter where they are in the hierarchy uh, uh, that might not be presented to you otherwise. So the other command that was on that list was module show. And what module show does is it shows exactly how a module is modifying your user environment to make that software available to you. So I kind of group these uh, commands inside the module into three sort of general areas. One is just sort of general area, which tells you um, these are sort of commands that tell you about what modules could be loaded at which time. Some help um, and what this module is. This is just a short description. And the yellow ones are ones that change your path. So path is like, where does your user environment look for executables to run? So you can see here, it's prepending the path with the location of HDF5, the bin folder, so that if you type something in your command line, it'll go to that bin and look for that command and, and run it for you now. Um, similarly, with a lot of these other paths, these paths are used for uh, codes when they compile and look for other, when other codes compile and look for that library, the look might look in those environment variables and those paths uh, for your library. So this is modifying all of those. The green is environmental variables that are set. So for example, HDF5 root, right, is set when you run this environment to this value. Uh, when, you run, when you load this module, it's set to this value so that if you're, again, loading a library that's looking for this environment variable HDF5 root to find out where HDF5 is, it can do that. So that's kind of what's going on with the modules and how they're changing your environment so that you make more to make more software available to you. Okay, so the next thing I'm going to talk about is compiling. So um the you know I I start with kind of some pretty basic examples, but Probably most of you will not run, you know, did not come to Perlmutter to run Hello World, right? And, you know, all I can say is that compiling code is, is fairly complex and complicated and, and kind of everything is a little bit different or different enough to make it difficult. And and that's kind of, you know, the, the world that we live in, I guess. <laughs> so um, I'm going to kind of go through some basic knowledge and give you kind of hopefully a baseline. I'm going to also give you some sporadic random knowledge about compiling. And, and somewhere in the mix of all of it, hopefully you find some things that are useful when you come across your issue. OK. <laughs> so with that said, if you have trouble, file a ticket. <laughs> OK, so here we go. Um, 
if you were doing hello world at your own machine, you might have done something like this GCC. Now I compile my code, hello world comes out, right? That's the basic thing. Well, the next step towards supercomputing is MPI. Right. So instead of using, you know, if you're going to now do multiple processes, let's suppose you had a multiple process hello world, you would do MPI CC hello world C. And then all of a sudden, you know, now your code is going super fast because it's using multiple processes and doing much more. Well, in that same vein, right, on Perlmutter, what we're going to do is we're going to use a combination of the programming environment module. So, right, this program environment can do. And this thing here, what we call CC, this is a compiler wrapper. So the combination hey, of yeah. these... <laughs> Somebody's excited about compiler wrappers. Okay. Um, so we're going to use the combination of these two to get into exactly the, the, the position we want with our code, right? And this is what's going to make it work the best on Perlmutter. That's why you have the fanciest car next to it. So um, what are compiler wrappers? Well. Um, for compiler wrappers are essentially these, instead of GCC, right? We have the module programming environment and this command, CC, right? Depending on which programming environment I'm in, it might go to a different compiler. So for example, I can tell you this one is programming environment GNU because it's doing the G++ compiler when I do the C capital CC command, right? This is for the C++ compiler. If if you want to see what this compiler wrapper is doing under the hood, that's what this command here does. Now, when you when you compile this, you don't need to put this command in. This is just for illustration purposes here. But you can see that if I include this, it'll tell me all the things that are actually being substituted into this compiler wrapper. So for example, instead of CC, you would put all of this, this, and this, and this, and this and actually a bunch of other stuff, which I'll show you on the next slide, into this, all into this one single command line. This is all optimizations. Um, you know, this includes um, the MPI library, right? I didn't specify MPI here, but this included it anyways. This also includes any math libraries I need. Again, here, it was included, even though I didn't specify here. All these things are done automatically. All these things have been configured by HPE engineers create engineers and nurse staff to give you, um, to make sure your code is running in a performant way on our system. So using the compiler wrappers allows us to take advantage of all that in a very simple way. Now I showed you two or three, there's actually a bunch more. It includes extra stuff, it'll link in as needed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The whole point is there's a lot that goes into this under the hood when you're using that CC, capital CC, lowercase CC and FTN to compile your code. So again, I said that these work in combination with the programming environment. So for example, if I wanted to compile with a different compiler other than the GCC compiler, what I would do is I would load the programming environment NVIDIA. So in this example, the programming environment NVIDIA includes the MVC compiler. So if you notice this line here hasn't changed from the last example, but instead of using G++ now, now it's using MVC++ just because I, use switched from programming environment GNU to programming environment NVIDIA. And similarly with Intel, if I wanted to use the Intel compiler, I wouldn't change the line I use to compile my code. I'd only load a different programming environment module. And that would change to this to the correct Intel compiler, this ICPX. Notice the optimization flags also change uh, with all of this too, including much more, many more lines, which I didn't fit into the slide. So this is sort of a chart to put all these things in one place, right? So if you're using this module, these are the new compilers. If you use capital CC, you get G++, lowercase CC, you get GCC. If you use FTN, you get G Fortran, and this is the MPI library you get. These are all the same to point out that you always use the same compiler wrapper, right? Same compiler wrapper for C, same compiler wrapper for C, but what changes is the module, the programming environment module, each one. Um, you'll notice a lot of my slides have these links to more information in the docs. So I'll, I'll just leave it there for your reference. Um, if you're wondering which programming environment to start with uh, and, and work from, the kind of top to bottom here. So if you never compiled your code before and you weren't sure what was going to make it work, I would first suggest try this one. If that one 
is not what you want, maybe try this one and then work down from there um, and, and until you're successful and satisfied. <clears throat> so the wrappers, like I said, they have a lot of things built into them. They will automatically link things like MPA, uh, MPI, LAPAC, LOSS, Scala Pack, and more all automatically. Uh, there's other modules. So if you have modules loaded like Cray HDF5 or Cray FFTW, uh, those will all get linked automatically. Um, another thing to point out is, you know, people often, um, you know, most of you are doing scientific codes, you need math libraries. Those are all contained in this Cray LibSci library. So if you want to find out more information on that, I suggest looking into the, the man file with this command man intro to LibSci. Um, that one that gets linked automatically, I've found works for most codes. Um, so this is where we kind of go off of, you know, basic compile into sort of more of the woods. <laughs> uh, when we start to talk about build systems, because most of people usually when they come, they have a code, you know, they're not necessarily, like I said, trying to compile hello world. They're trying to run a code that they got from somewhere else. Sometimes the code's 20 years old. Sometimes it's from somewhere else or whatever, right? All sorts of different things. It's a wide variety. Um, the probably two most common build systems that I see are autoconf or autoconfig, auto tools. Those are all kind of the same group of things. That's the same, like we have a make file, you type the config, uh, make, make install. That's that's all kind of autoconf. And the other one is CMake. Um, the important thing for these build systems is they often have some certain variables that they use to look for the C compiler, the C++ compiler, and the Fortran compiler. Whenever somebody asks me to help them compile their code, the first thing I try to do is try to make sure that those variables, those environment variables are pointed to the correct wrappers, the Cray wrappers, so that they can pick up all those extra flags which makes the code work on our system, right? So if you were trying to get this to compile, compile with autoconfig, um, autoconf, you, my suggestion would be you want to make these variables pick up the compiler wrappers. You can do that with this type of step, right? If you're doing it at the configure step, you're using this, this method, right? You can do it with this command. If you're doing CMake, this is kind of the CMake standard way to do it. You can run this um, to specify which, uh, to specify the, the, the compiler wrappers in your build. So the goal is to get these build systems to use the Cray compiler wrappers so that the code will compile correctly. So this is just a few examples of, like I said, the random sporadic information that hopefully may come in handy for you someday. So for example, uh, if we're trying to compile this code called Slate um, or the Slate, li Slate library, you can see here, looking at its directions, it says, oh, okay, well, if you are going to compile this, what you first need to do is make this file and you need to say CXX is equal to MPI CIXX. Well, that will not work on Perlmutter and that will keep your code from compiling. What you'll need to do is say, make this file. Instead of saying it MPI CXX, you're going to want to say CXX equals CC, FC equals FTN. And, you know, when we get into the blast stuff, it gets a little bit tricky, but, um, you know, you need to make sure that part of the code is enabled. But as long as you get the compiler wrapper set, it will find the math libraries it needs. Um, as long as the code is asking for them to be compiled. And then, you know, you do the same make, make install after that. Um, if you're using CMake, right? One thing, another random piece of information, just so you know it's there, if you ever get stuck trying to figure out something with CMake, is this GUI, right? And it's not the same type of GUI we were talking about with no machine. This is like a terminal GUI, right? Um, so you don't need to do any exporting to make this work. But if you're, if you find yourself in the CMake process, I'm going to tell you about this now so that when you're trying to figure this out, you would oh, yeah, I remember. And then maybe it comes across. But but I, I can't explain the whole process now. But if you're doing ccmake or cmake dot dot to, to configure your code before you do the make and make install steps, um, try ccmake dot dot, and that'll bring you to this GUI. And what this does is if you press T, like what I've done here, and this is what I'm showing you here is the advanced mode. T, it shows you. And even without the advanced mode, it shows you what the options are picking up. 
So if you look here, CMake, the CXX compiler has picked up this path for the compiler. So I can confirm, this GUI gives me a way to confirm that the build system has picked up the correct compiler. And I don't have to worry about making sure it's doing something weird like MPI CC or something like that and having to fix that. So, so this gives me a way to confirm that and ensure my build's gonna work correctly. Um, just a few comments about linking. Uh, so a lot of the modules, like we talked about in the module show, they'll prepend the library path. So you don't necessarily have to point out where they're located in the system if you need to link them. Um, query wrappers build dynamically linked executables by default. I, you know, the way I remember this is these are the ones that, you know, you're trying to run your code and it says, oh, can't find the shared library, right? This just means that, uh, you know, at runtime, it looks for where that library is and, and pulls it in. Um, if you try to do static compilation where you compile everything into one big static blob <laughs> uh, with the, something like the static flag or create link type equal static, this can fail and it's not supported on Perlmutter. So uh, we don't recommend that. So uh, just to sort of a mid summary, best practices for compiling quantum coding, use the system compiler wrappers, CC, CC, and FDN. Um, when you're doing build systems such as autoconf, um, use, you know, try to verify the compiler wrappers are being used. So now I'm going to go over some some examples. Unfortunately, um, you know, due to sort of what the constraints of what we have here, I can only show you like hello world type stuff, but but I think it's a good baseline to start with. So here is my hello world code with MPI and open MP. So I have um, multiple processor parallelism. I have thread parallelism all in my, my one example here. To enable thread parallelism, right, OpenMP, I'm going to use this flag. Right? And again, like depending on which compiler you're using, it might be a slightly different flag. Um, to point out again, where I go when I want to find out about compilers is I look at the man pages. You know, um, there's a wealth of information in there. It can be overwhelming, but but just try to search for the flag you think you're looking for, and you can actually learn a lot uh, by reading through there. So in this case, I'm going to need to use this F OpenMP to enable OpenMP uh, for this Hello World code. So this is what this, you know, this is my compile line. This is what I'm going to show you here. So what I've loaded is the GNU programming environment. And we're going to comp compile that Hello World example I had up above. Here's my Hello World. These are my modules. It might be slightly different than what you see today, but essentially the default module set will be fine, will be fine here. I include my F OpenMP flag. Um, so I need that with the GCC compiler. I get my executable. Uh, if I'm doing a threaded application, I have to tell it how many threads to, to use. I have a few other uh, environment variables I should set. These are all listed in the docs for how to run an OpenMP code. I run it. Hey, I get my four processes with two threads each and success, right? So just to show you, I use the compiler wrapper. I still you have to specify the flag to get OpenMP and that compiled the code. Now, if you want to compile fancier stuff with things like Computer Aware MPI, the module that does that is this GPU module, right? So if I look at module show GPU, this is how we learn to see what it's doing under the covers. What it essentially does is takes that mpitch GPU support enabled environmentable var environment variable and sets it to one. It also loads the optimization for the NVIDIA 80 GPUs. Um, so that is enough to tell it when we're using the create compiler wrappers to use CUDA aware MPI. So I have an example here where I'm going to compile something with CUDA aware MPI. And, you know, but I'm essentially going to show you, it's like, I can do this without even typing, right? It's that easy, right? <laughs> um, yeah, my own jokes. So um, again, I've got my default set of modules, except that I've loaded the programming environment NVIDIA and I have made sure to have the GPU module loaded. This is just what I'm reiterating here for the typing version of myself. Same thing, I'm using the compiler wrappers. 
this is the executable I'm at. I'm, I'm linking this hardware location library because that's required by the source code. Put those in. I tell it, you know, how many processes, how many processors per, how many CPUs per process, um, and how many GPUs I want. And this is the output I get, which shows that the code is working. Okay. So that's, you know, so so what you should be seeing is that, okay, it's not that difficult to uh, include kudo where MPI in the compile process, as long as we're using the compiler wrappers. Um, so more resources on compiling. Um, I've got four here. Uh, probably the best one is the most recent one uh, written by uh, Rebecca. She wrote a thing on how to compile, uh, just to sort of step like uh, how to compile things on Norse resources, Norse resources. If you want more advanced information, you should probably get into these other three where we talk about all the other different uh, compilers. Um, some of the advice I covered earlier goes into greater detail um, and so on. So those are good resources in the docs for compiling. Uh, I want to point out that at you know at NERSC we support a wide range of programming models. You know I've these are all the logos I can find. So we've got the MPitch MPI. We do have Open MPI, but you know we're, we're I've been told to talk about best practices, and I would say that the the system MPI is MPitch. So you should always try to get this one working first. Um, unless you have a specific reason to go to open MPI and uh, you know, then, then, then you can try the open MPI available. We have Cocos, we've got NVIDIA QDA, we have open MP. We have this standard parallelism, both in, in C++ and Fortran. We support SQL, open ECC, also HIP. So, so however you want, you know, whatever programming model you have, we probably uh, have support for it. Um, and again, more docs for more information on that. Uh, so now that you've compiled your code and you've got your executable, the next question is, where do you put it? So, um, you know, by default, most of these uh, installers, you know, will be a script that'll try to install it into some sort of dash, you know, slash user location, either slash users that share, slash users that local, something like this. But if you're doing that on Perlmutter, you as a user cannot write to that location. Um, we need that, you know, especially reserved for our system admins to do all their fancy stuff. Um, so where can you install it then? Well, you're going to have to tell your install location to pick one of these other places. And, uh, you know, I'm not exactly sure how much this was cover will be covered in other areas, but I'll just briefly review here. So you've got your home directory. And as far as performance, you know, if you really want to get performance out of your code, this is not really optimal. It's not a home directory is not optimized for running um, highly parallelized code at you know in a, high, in a high performance way. So mostly, what you want to keep in your home directory is just the source code that you're wanting to compile. Maybe some scripts for running them, and you know the home directory is relatively small, so you can't put a lot of stuff in it. Um, so it's not really where you want to install your code. Um, for your, the Scratch file system. Right. This is you can, where you can locate it. You can do CD money sign scratch, and it'll take you there. This is the most uh, the optimal performance on the system, but it has some drawbacks if you're thinking about installing software. So it's really, you know, it's not really easy to share. So for example, if you were compiling a software that you wanted to share with everybody in your project, if you did it on Scratch Drive, you wouldn't be able to do that, right? And it's really designed for sort of temporary input output data input output from your runs. Um, it is very performant, but you know, it's not designed for uh, executable software. Um, the other location that is designed for where your software is this global common slash software, and then you have your project directory. Now, this is performant, maybe maybe not as much as Scratch. Um, however, uh, still quite performant, and it's optimized for software installs. The only thing to point out here is it's read only on compute nodes. That's part of the optimization, right? Um, so <clears throat> you just have to be aware of that when you're when you're using certain types of software. Um, so if you ask me, like, where should I install my software? I would say, like, personally, if I'm just testing and I'm just trying to get something to work, I, 
if you're just testing, it doesn't matter if you're kind of home or scratch, but as soon as you want to use it on a regular basis, then you should move it to common because, you know, that's, that's going to be the best uh, position for sharing with other people, for running it yourself, for, for not using up your allocation the wrong way. It won't get purged by accident if you don't use it for a while and you forget how to compile it, that kind of stuff. Um, you know, you can, you know, you also have this community file system, but it's really mostly for sharing data among projects. So um, think about trying to install your software in global common that software dash your project. Um, so a few other things that I mentioned at the beginning for software is there's a few other places to get software and SPAC is another one. So the SPAC, the tagline is it's a, it's a package manager for supercomputers. It also works really well on your local machine. Though if you're trying to do this on, on at home on your computer or even on your Mac, uh, they've been doing a lot of work to make this work. Um, but the way you get SPAC up and running is you just clone the repo with this command. You source this script. That's what this command does. The dot tells you it's the same as the um, synonym for a source. SPAC, and that activates the SPAC environment. And then you just type SPAC, install the package you want. Um, you, you know, There's a bunch more SPAC commands that are at this website that'll tell you more about how to use SPAC. But the, the point of this slide is to tell you that you can use SPAC on Perlmutter as a way to bring in the software you want. Um, why did I put the backwards penguin here? Uh, <laughs> so when you try to install SPAC on Perlmutter, the funny thing is it usually tries to download and build a lot of redundant dependencies. Um, it is possible to tell SPAC not to do this and to use other files, but you know it, it it's it's a little bit troublesome in the fact that you know maybe the code won't work exactly as designed if you're not using the one that SPAC thinks you should. So so it's you know I guess the moral of the story is nothing in life is easy. <laughs> but but sometimes SPAC works and sometimes it is easy and sometimes it doesn't and sometimes it's not easy. But if you want to just give it a try, it's worth trying. Another set of another way to get a lot of software is the E4S, the Extreme Cell Scientific Software Stack. And what this is, is this is like a curated set of software packages um, that get additional testing on our systems. Um, now, it, there's a lot of confusion between E4S and SPAC. Um, SPAC is kind of the bigger, wider thing, which has many more software, uh, much more software available to you that you can install, you know, kind of uh, from, from anywhere, right? Um, as long as it's included in SPAC. E4S is a subset of that. These are scientific software packages, largely written by DOE folks that have already been installed and compiled on Perlmutter. A lot of them get regular testing um, by by some of our nurse staff to make sure they're functioning. And what you can do, with the, they're available through this module. So the way you access to them is you say module load E4S, just like I did here. And the way it's set up now is we have four different environments you can choose from, just if you're familiar with Conda and Conda environments, kind of the same thing. Um, in this example, I picked the CUDA environment to show you which ones the GPU enabled ones are. And then once you've activated that environment, you can find lots of different codes that are already installed uh, using this spac find command. And so you'll, you know, I only showed you the first three lines of this list, but there's there's like over a hundred just in the CUDA environment. And if you look at the four environments that are available, you get a total of 478. Um, so you do get a wide range of possible packages to install, uh, po possible packages that you can access. So um my 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 personal hot take on this is is similar to the SPAC thing where I would give it a try and if it works it works if it fails then 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 just try something else because trying to troubleshoot why something like this doesn't work can be more complex um, but again when they work they're really nice and convenient and it's worth trying just for that fact so this brings me to my last slide um, these are my suggestions for best practices for programming environments and compilation. Um, the first one is for modules, use module spider because that will negate that module hierarchy and make sure you are searching through all the available modules. Um, the big lesson of this whole talk is to use the compiler wrappers because they do all the magic behind the scenes to make your code work. So capital CC, lowercase CC, and FTN in combination with those programming environment modules. 
Um, if you're doing build systems, like I said, autoconf and CMake, um, you know, verify they're using those compiler wrappers. Uh, a nice trick with CMake is that command C CMake to give you that GUI so you can confirm the things are um, as you think they are. Um, another, I think, good hint is man files. So, I mean, I'm sure man is short for manual. Um, but if you wanted to know about MPI in the system and you admire people who have been on the system for like 20 or 30 years and how do they know all this deep knowledge, it's it's basically because they just read this part here. Nothing fancy. But that's, that's where all that information is. Um, another tip or trick is if you want to see some example builds, there's several scripts available at this location in this repo, Nurse Community Software. So if you want to see how I build software, I have some scripts there that I've written. So you can look there and see how I set the flags and, and do the things. And always, if you have more questions or need any help, um, you know, you can find us at help.nurse.gov or, or if you ever see me on at the Berkeley lab or on the street, you am happy to answer your Perlmutter supercomputing questions. So with that, I guess uh, I'll leave it there.